Hello and welcome. I'm Andrew Culp, Professor of Media History and Theory here at CalArts. First, I wanna say thank you so much for West Hollywood for helping host this series. Even though we're virtual and online, they've been an incredible assistance to making it all happen. And we love reaching out to those in the West Hollywood community. I'd also like to thank CalArts, the School of Critical Studies and the Master's uh, uh, Program in Aesthetics and Politics for being the host, uh, generously hosting this series for many years. I'd like to draw everyone's attention to a recent blog post by one of our graduate students, Courtney. It's called, If You're Doing Nothing Wrong, You Should Have Nothing to Hide. And it's a critique of this approach. And you should feel free to visit it on our open assembly blog, which is just open-assembly.calarts.edu at any time, as well as many numerous resources going back years now uh, of really excellent scholarly work going alongside our uh, speaking series. I'd also like to thank you as our audience for joining us today. I know that it's a large commitment to show up on Friday night sometimes, and so we're just so excited to have you here. And also, I'd like to introduce our WAP program. It stands for West Hollywood Aesthetics and Politics. It's been going on for nearly 10 years now, and it's an opportunity to connect with artists, designers, thinkers, people working in politics and all around. In this semester, we're going on the theme that I'm convening called Blackout was prompted by um, media theorist Simone Brown's writing, in which she argues that the targets of surveillance, particularly black targets of surveillance, do not always need increased visibility as their goal. Instead, Brown sometimes proposes, quote, fugitive, fugitive acts of escape, resistance, and the productive disruptions that happen when blackness enters the frame. So the idea here is, disruptive approach in which it's not simply about making things visible, but sometimes invisible or disruptively so. Uh, just a quick note on the format. In terms of presentation order, we're going to have our presenta main presentation by Hamid Khan, which will go on for, you know, let's say about 45 minutes. Then we're going to have a question and answer period. For that, please join us in the chat box of YouTube. You may need to sign in with an account in order to enable that. Also note that there is sometimes a short delay. So even if you ask a question immediately, it may take the speaker just a little bit to get to it. And then also in it, please be mindful of others and how you're discussing that we're all trying to have a um, excellent conversation to really raise each other up. So in terms of the talk, I'd like to introduce our two speakers, their bios, and then um, uh, let them sort of begin. And, you know, I'm not probably the only person excited to have Hamid and someone from the coalition here today. Um, I've known them uh, for a number of years now and have just been absolutely bowled away at the amazing successes, helping combat numerous surveillance programs over the years, including a major victory recently, not only about laser zones, which was drawing a noose around all of uh, Skid Row, but also predictive policing, which has been in national and international news for a time. And it's just amazing to see the sort of successes they've had. So first, we're going to have Hamid speaking about abolishing the stalker state. His respondent will be Ken Ehrlich. Let me quickly just give you their bios. Uh, Hamid Khan is an organizer and coordinator with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. The mission of the coalition is to build community-based power to dismantle police surveillance, spying, and infiltration programs. The coalition utilizes multiple campaigns to advance innovative organizing here in Los Angeles, but also its implications regionally, nationally, internationally, and, you know, they have amazing conversations with people all across the globe. Uh, Hamid also serves on the board of May 1st Technology, a membership organization that engages in building movements by advancing a strategic use of collective control of technology for local struggles, global transformations, and emancipations without borders. And then lastly, we're also going to be joined by Ken Ehrlich, who is an artist and writer based here in Los Angeles. His wide ranging practice involves sculpture, photography, video and performance. It has been presented internationally and also more locally at the California Pacific Triennial at the Orange County Museum of Art, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Hammer, High Desert Test Sites. His writings has also been published widely, including recent texts on networks, infrastructure and logistics, such as in Blind Field Journal and Drain Magazine. And he also co-edited the Surface Tension book, which came out with Errant Bodies Press. Currently, and why he's here today, is that he teaches in the School of Critical Studies at CalArts in the Department of Riverside, but is also organizing with the group called Cops Off Campus, the UCFTB group. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming our speakers tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Andrew, and uh, greetings, everybody, and hello, Ken. Um, hope everybody is staying safe and healthy. Um, honored to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. Um, once again, uh, I'm Hamid Khan. I'm an organizer and a coordinator at uh, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. 
Um, I've been organizing in LA for, uh, gosh, I'm going to start aging myself, about 35 years. Um, so I'm, uh, originally, I was born in Pakistan. I'm an immigrant. I migrated from Pakistan in the late 1970s, so about 40, 42 years ago. Um, and and uh, and pretty much been organizing in LA. So um, the story that I wanted to share is more in the context of storytelling rather than like you know just what technology is doing because I want to lift off from uh, Simone Brown's uh, work that uh, Andrew was just quoting as well. And we actually start our report before the bullet hits the body uh, with Professor Brown's quote about uh, that surveillance is nothing new for black folks. It is, um, in fact, uh, it is the fact of anti-blackness. So I think that's what really guides our work as to, as to how um, the work of the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition starting off about 10 or 11 years ago uh, one of the primary focus was that how do we change the narrative? How do we change the, the existing understanding or the conventional understanding of surveillance, uh, which was based upon, of course, the, 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 the history of COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence programs of uh, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the Red Squads, which preceded um, COINTELPRO, the FBI operations, and then more recently, post 9-11, uh, surveillance and infiltration that has been going on. Um, but the, the conventional uh, narrative had always been rooted in the invasion of privacy, that this was always seen as through this very narrow lens. And I think we also have to unpack that why uh, this has historically been seen through this lens of invasion of privacy, because this, quite frankly, this has been built with the white experience of our white folks' experience of what surveillance means. And when you have, and when you understand a certain protections, um, then surveillance looks a little differently. And the reason I said certain protections, that the remedy for violation or invasion of privacy was also rooted in the constitution, that, uh, that the constitution that provides answers and uh, the fight back, whether it's the, the, the First Amendment violation, Fourth Amendment violation, Tenth Amendment violation, you know that, um, or, or different types of uh, amendments and on and on and on. But as we, we understand the history of the United States uh, going back 500 years uh, or, or 235, 40 years since the founding of the Republic, and particularly as a non-white person, uh, you start recognizing that, no, it's much more deeper than that, because one of the things that immediately, as an immigrant and somebody with a name like Hamid Hussein Khan, uh, an immigrant from Pakistan who's been fighting against the police state, uh, so you see that there's a big bullseye constantly following you. But one of the most immediate sort of um, uh, observation and experience that you have is of the otherness, of your own otherness, that how... Um, you are being looked at, how you're being observed, how you're being watched, um, and what does it mean to you? So, so privacy by itself is immediately sort of tossed aside because that by itself becomes a very privileged space to be. And then you start recognizing and understanding that it's much deeper, uh, particularly within the broader ideological constructs of or and practice and traditions of white supremacy, uh, capitalism, patriarchy, settler colonialism, that, that if, and with the history of policing, that if policing is the knife of white supremacy to maintain dominance, uh, to maintain that social control, then surveillance kind of becomes the tip of that uh, knife. That, that surveillance and keeping an eye on the other becomes the primary motive uh, mode of, of policing. And of course, you know, we, we, we've, talk, we've heard the history around the Panopticon effect about the prison systems and various other things and keeping an eye. And then further, uh, as we unpack it, uh, we start realizing that how surveillance becomes a primary uh, motive or primary practice to police race, uh, poverty, and suspect bodies. So in a sense, like, you know, the otherness of the other uh, and in that suspect body being a queer trans person or or a femme body or however we want we want to look at it that you know how suspicion kind of constantly looms. So for us for the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition, one of the one of the first challenges was that how do we how do we almost like subvert this 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 uh, very narrow scope of invasion of privacy, and and look at it that no this just can't be fixed. 
um, this can be reformed. It's just not possible uh, to advocate for something which is so deeply entrenched, with is, which is the primary tool for maintaining that dominance and social control. So the only option that we have is to fight for its abolition, fight for its complete dismantlement. And of course, you know, abolition is increasingly becoming um, fashionable as well. And I would venture to say that, that there's a lot of, uh, you know, and then abolition is being approached in many different ways. But I also want to lift that uh, piece right here is that, that sometimes abolition and the conversations around abolition do get sanitized where what is almost forced to, to speak about abolition in the context of, well, we are creating something different. Well, of course, like, you know, I mean, when you abolish it, you're creating something different all along. You're imagining something different. You're thinking about something different. You're constructing through that imagination that what, what peace and health and, and shelter and healthy food, what that would look like or education would look like. But abolition also means destruction. I mean, it also means that we have to, we, I mean, you know, we have to, uh, we have to destroy something, we have to abolish it, we have to dismantle it, right? So in a sense that, you know, so how do we then uh, build our knowledge? How do we decolonize that knowledge? Because once it's limited within the scope of, of invasion of privacy, then the remedies are also seen through a legal lens that, okay, let's go file a case. Uh, let's see what kind of constitutional violations have happened and let's find somebody who's been harmed. So surveillance for the longest time remained sort of stuck within the domain of, uh, you know, nonprofit law firms like the ACLU and various others. But and, and the conversation hovered around a 30,000 foot level. It was never brought down to ground that how every day 24 seven surveillance is something that is that is constantly tracing, tracking, following in order to criminalize, to contain uh, uh, communities and particularly the black communities, indigenous communities, and that 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 practice and deployment and operationalization has always been there. So I just wanted to kind of share uh, some of those uh, some of those sort of uh, you know founding uh, understandings and founding narratives as well. And if and if I was to if I was to claim, you know, and, and I'm not a big fan of using the term victory or things like that, because it's a journey that we are on. If I was to claim the Stop LAPD Spying's Coalition's contribution, uh, at least in LA, uh, towards a larger movement building, it would be that how we have normalized this conversation on surveillance, how we have brought it down to a ground level where, where surveillance was not seen as something which is critical uh, to wage a war on poor people. Surveillance was not seen something as critical to which would lead to mass displacement and eviction of people. So we have to really, really just kind of unpack and debunk a lot of these things and subvert the existing uh, paradigms. So I'm going to just uh, share a few, a uh, few slides as well as we have this conversation to talk about uh, the work of the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. Um, so let's see, let me just go from here. Um, awesome poster, uh, just uh, uh, just compliments to Jason Zabeda, a young warrior who was on the front lines as a young uh, person in the immigrant rights movement and also uh, a, an artist um, in, the, in, the, in the Chicano community and who uh, uh, drew this, this piece. But I think I, I want to start off by also looking at the third leg of the stool, because many times we talk about violence and we talk about capitalism. So, and of course, living in a system of state capitalism, uh, many a times the conversations hover around the violence of the state and the, and the corporate violence. But what misses is in a very integral part of how violence is promoted, how violence is intellectualized is the academy. And that how deeply the academy is complicit uh, into promoting, advancing, intellectualizing and, and creating roadmaps for violence as well. And here's one example of Dr. Edward, ben, Edward Banfield, who was, uh, who was an intellectual social scientist, was a professor emeritus as, at the University of Chicago, was at Harvard uh, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And, and this is, a, and also was an advisor to presidents Nixon, Ford, and Reagan. And this is a quote from uh, one of his books, I believe it's uh, The Unheavenly Cities. Um, where he speaks that the implication that lower class culture is pathological seems fully warranted. Rather than waste time and public money, implementing policies based on the false notion that all men were created equal, better just to face facts and acknowledge the natural divisions that exist. 
Members of the lower classes should leave school in ninth grade to get a jump on a lifetime of manual labor. The, <clears throat> the minimum wage should be repealed to encourage employers to create more jobs for low value labor. The state should give intensive birth control guidance to the incompetent poor, and the police should feel free to crack down on young lower class men. So now when you, when you look at this, 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 this quote, when you look at the mentality, when you look at the, the, the scholarship, of course, the scholarship is also guided and instructed by one's own lived experiences, by one's own political leanings, by one's own where they would like the society to go, what they were, where they would want the environment to look like. And of course, um, with all due respect, Andrew is an academic, so I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I mean, um, if I'm off base, like, you know, I'm, uh, this is just my lay understanding that how scholarships are, are, are guided and, and through these experiences. But then you see how it gets implemented as well. And I think it's very telling that when we look at uh, someone like that to be an advisor to presidents Nixon, Ford, and Reagan, we know what how it's going to play out on the street. Because with Nixon looking at the war on drugs, the war on crime, uh, the war on gangs, and then, of course, Ford continuing with that. And, of course, Ronald Reagan then moving into that whole welfare queen narrative and the assault on people on the, on the very, the, you know, the, 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 the lowest of the you know, the, the least amount of, of safety nets or anything else. So it, it kind of tells us a story, but I think here also is also interesting that one of the mentees for Dr. Edward Manfield was also James Q. Wilson. And I'm throwing some names here because that name is also critical because James Q. Wilson was also one of the intellectual architects along with George Kelly of the Broken Windows Policing. And James Q. Wilson uh, co-authored that, uh, that essay, that article in The Atlantic back in 1982 that created a roadmap uh, for what, what later became known as quality of life policing. And of course, you know, it was unleashed in Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles with the full thrust of LAPD under Bill Bratton in 2005. Um, so just wanted to share that too, that you know, when we are looking at uh, surveillance, it is important that we look at it in, in its totality of policing as well, and not just as a subset of policing. Uh, which then, you know, as I spoke earlier, they talked uh, that how surveillance becomes a key element that how race and poverty and suspect bodies are surveilled, but also being guided through that white gaze, that who's in, who's out, who's accessible, who should have access, who should not, who should be incarcerated, who should be released, and then how laws are created and, and, and various other things happen. Um, for us at the coalition, going back, some of the uh, key pieces in order to do this work on a much more deeper level and to really bring it on a human level was that we had to really ground ourselves that what we are looking at is not a moment in time, but a continuation of history. That surveillance and this piece didn't start after Edward Snowden or didn't start after, you know, just the 9-11, but there's a long history going back to, and I'll, and, uh, uh, I'll bring up the slide as well, along with going back to Professor Simone Brown and their mapping of the of some of going back to the, the lantern laws in 1706, uh, where if you were an enslaved body and if you were a, a black or an indigenous person and you were walk, you walked without the, the master in a public space, you had to literally walk with a lantern in your hand uh, with a candle wick to self-identify yourself as a threat to the system as the other. And that's where the second piece comes in around the creation of the other. And in that, I think it becomes really important because historically speaking, what we have is, and, and we can't have this conversation without grounding ourselves in race, that how the white gaze looks at it, and how in order for white supremacy uh, to maintain control, uh, the other has to be demonized. The other has to be criminalized and, and at their service are, are, is the academy that how and various other elements of the, of the infrastructure as well, that how the demonization gets then legislated, how it gets uh, uh, institutionalized, how there are books written about it, what is the role of Hollywood, uh, how art plays a major role. So how was that we saw this whole, these various faces being paraded throughout that then you know, led to the demonization of people, like the, the face of the savage native, the face of the criminal black, the face of the illegal Latino, the face of the, the disloyal and manipulative Asian, the face of the terrorist Muslim, um, the face of uh, a, uh, um, a deviant trans, and on and on and on. And, uh, excuse me, just a fire truck out there. And I'm reminded that even more in a more recent history, and not so recent, but executive order 9066, 
uh, which sent uh, the Japanese uh, of uh, a, a Japanese American who had been living here for fourth and fifth generation to these concentration camps as seen as the other. And the argument that was used is very telling that it was under, of course, the US Army was, uh, was managing all of that. And the main general, General DeWitt, his argument was, and I directly quote, that persons of Japanese ancestry contain enemy race blood, hence inherently disloyal and shall always remain unassimilable. So now what we have is that not just it's the otherness on a visual level, but how criminality gets assigned. Right. So I think these are the things that you're understanding that becomes really critical for us to build our work uh, from the ground up and to really base it on people's own lived experiences. Um, third piece is for us was the, the desensationalization, the rhetoric uh, to desensationalize the rhetoric of national security, because it's always been there. The, the Russians are here. The communists are here. The anarchists are going to take over everything. The hordes of those People are coming from the southern border. So, and, and as a result, if you think about it, uh, for the last uh, however year, 26 plus 20, 246 years or 244 years, we've always been at war. And even before that, you know, the war was always at home. So waging war, uh, and that was always so locally, uh, the native population, the black population and the migrant population of, of non-European descent became a threat to national security. So how they should be controlled, how they should be monitored, surveillance become a primary motive in that. And of course, the fight is anchored in human rights that, um, and we also, I would even argue that we come from a premise that uh, the constitution itself is a blueprint for oppression. The constitution itself is a roadmap for oppression as well. Um, I mean, we're still uh, talking about cops having qualified immunity. Like what the heck does it mean? Right. I mean, even with the Constitution having been there where the, the rights of people should be uh, the primary, but no, it's the rights of how white supremacy is maintained and how the, the rest are controlled. Uh, here's a quick snapshot of the history of surveillance. And Andrew, I'll, I'll be happy to send this uh, sli uh, slideshow to you as well if folks wanted to get a copy of that. Uh, just going back, lantern laws, slave patrols, you know, now more and more people know the origins of policing, particularly in the South, uh, rooted in slave or black codes. Black codes become really critical because just today we found out that the city council is, is not going to be voting on 4118D, which is a municipal code. Or uh, But black codes were the codes immediately in the aftermath of emancipation, supposedly, when, uh, when slavery was abolished. But then immediately black codes were established uh, to reincarcerate people um, based upon because then an incarcerated person's body could be used for slave labor. So in a sense, um, these were the things where loitering uh, or congregating or uh, speaking loudly to a white woman or selling your stuff out in the streets after dark became these codes that can get you into trouble and get you into prison. And I'm reminded about that, that as we talk about in the coalition that crime by itself is a social construct, it's also like who, who is creating those legal parameters? Who thought off the laws? Who's practicing it? who's operationalizing it, who's deploying it, and why are those laws in place where, you know, then you have, when you look at mass incarceration, obviously when you bring in poverty and very, and, and racism, obviously when you look at the numbers, it's, it's, it's overwhelmingly black folks and, and, and other non-white folks. So, so that becomes really crucial. Of course, Jim Crow, uh, the history of segregation and Jim Crow and, and then the lynchings. Red squads are also really crucial because now uh, every year we celebrate May Day. So the history of red squads is that we celebrate May Day because May Day came off of a, a huge strike that happened in Chicago, which also became known as the Haymarket strike, which was really a fight for an eight hour work day. This was back in 1886. Um, and then some people were killed, a couple of bombs went off, this, that, and the other, um, but which led to the creation of International Workers' Solidarity Day or May Day. But what's also important is that this was the first time within two years that Chicago Police Department in 1888 formed a covert section within Chicago Police Department. And that's why uh, I said that this proceeds way before the FBI or federal agencies um, became like the primary um, uh, movers of surveillance. 
So that's why then Red Squads were in Chicago, then were in New York, in Philadelphia, in LA. And, and in LA, the history of Red Squads were that they were based out of, because there was a, 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 a covert section, uh, they were based out of the Chamber of Commerce. And about 80% of their budget came from the Manufacturers Association, the Retailers Association, and various other businesses where particularly the labor movement was being, was being violently crushed. And then of course, war on drugs, war on crime and various other things, um, you know, as we see the history of policing and surveillance going down to predictive policing. And why we kind of ended with predictive policing in this chart is also to really look at it that now how the, the language of science, the, the whole facade of pseudoscience and the veneer of science is being used to do exactly what was going on with lantern laws. Right. So, so where predictive policing now is these algorithms and hotspots and everything else, but you know, driving while black was predictive policing. Um, you know, the 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 black codes were predictive policing. That of course you're gonna you're gonna arrest people. Uh, uh, lantern laws were predictive policing. So, so we wanted to kind of break some of that. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of the LAPD's architectural surveillance, um, which lists various programs that people may have seen the See Something, Say Something program the iWatch program, suspicious activity reporting. But what's really instructive about a lot of these is that when we talk about militarization of policing, we don't. We need to look at it beyond, again, the narrow scope of the, the overt display of militarization, which is the tanks and grenade launchers and various other things and aerial patrols. We have to look at it that even every tool like predictive policing, its origins in Iraq and Afghanistan, trap wire, Stingray, dirt boxes, DRTs, license plate readers, drones. These are all technologies that have been developed by the US Army and US Marine Corps and US Navy. So it becomes really important. And also we need to look at when we talk about militarization of policing, that how it parallels the power of Department of Defense in, in LA. I mean, all of a sudden now, we see that there was a big move about defunding. And we actually just to put a plug in that today, the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition in partnership with Free Radicals just launched a defund surveillance campaign and to really just go after them and do a much more deeper dive um, that it's like the end of the world because half of the city, um, the, the, the police union has been mobilizing and organizing where the, the, the call to action is not defund, but defend LAPD. So the power that they have, the structural power, the, the, the political power, but you have active uh, people in the force who are becoming city council members, Joe Buscaeno of Council District 15 uh, down in San Pedro and was an active cop before he became a city council member. So in, in a sense, kind of looking at it through a bigger lens, and these are just some pictures um, that I wanted to share that. Um, so this is a digital receiver technology that basically um, can also zap up information from your phone, uh, even if the phone is turned off. Um, these are usually used in, in uh, small fixed wing airplanes and things like that. Folks may have heard of Stingray. Um, this is what a Stingray looks like. It basically triangulates and mimics cell phone towers and gathers uh, people's information, been used quite a bit. Uh, we just, uh, we recently, actually it's been a minute since we filed a public records request for the LAPD. And it's interesting the documents we are getting, but they're holding off some, uh, out some very key documents, which uh, we're gonna have to push the push the, uh, the fight a little bit more. This is trap wire. And what in this thing, you, you see this black box, um, this basically uses thermal imaging, uh, particularly at night, that how your body image can be picked up uh, and, and, and transferred to the spy centers where the, a lot of platforms and databases are there and be uploaded into different databases. Um, this is a high definition camera, which is at the, installed at the, at the, just under the nose of a helicopter. This was used quite a bit during the Occupy, how they were identifying people. Um, then, then, and this also has an extremely, extremely high resolution lens where from a 5,000 foot altitude, it can pick up a candy wrapper on the ground. This is a license plate reader um, being used quite a bit as well. Uh, I think the LAPD is looking to upgrade and do things like that. Um, the the uh, ICE, the Immigration Customs and Enforcement folks have a huge contract with Vigilant Technologies that, that manufactures them, uh, how they have been tracing and tracking um, many things. Uh, these are just drones. We had we we did have a big fight for about three and a half years. We're able to keep the drones grounded, um, but now the LAPD do have drones, and they're looking to expand their fleet as well. Um, these are body cameras. 
Uh, we also have reports that we have published about body cameras. Our report was published in, in late 2014 when they were starting out, which basically is it's a, it's a 24 seven tool of surveillance. Uh, and now with, uh, with, the, with the infusion of real-time facial recognition, um, there's, there's a lot to be happened. And either by policy, the Los Angeles Police Department claims that even background footage can be used for evidence as well. So if you're walking behind somebody uh, with a cop, or somebody who's being stopped and, and being questioned by the cops, your image can be used as well. This is freedom on the move. This is right out of the, the, the front lines in Afghanistan, out of the desert. It looks like a submarine scope and it rotates and it moves and it can do its own imaging and facial recognition. And this is a photo that we took on May Day 2016, I believe, because we have a, a project called Watch the Watchers where when they're, they're like this time doing protests as well, just kind of monitoring um, what, the, what the cops are doing. So keeping an eye on them and documenting different things as well. So I, I, I wanted to, the, 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 the point here that I was trying to make also along with uh, pictures are always nice to tell a lot of stories here, but it's also to understand the, the scale of the surveillance state that how vast um, this is. And Mike Downing, who was a previous, uh, up until like six, seven years ago, the head of LAPD's counterterrorism. I mean, he, and I, I'm directly quoting him, he, was, he would boast that he has on his Blackberry, he, had, he knows everything and everybody who's moving or what people are doing within the 468 mile, square mile radius. This was the LAPD's own, and and this was he was he was speaking to a group of people on on the rooftop of Standard Hotel in downtown Los Angeles, and that's where he made this claim that on my BlackBerry I can tell everything that's going on in the city within the 468. So in a sense, if you're walking down the street, if you're driving in your car, if you're sitting in a park, if you're just standing in a neighborhood, um, whatever you'd be doing, there's a constant piece of surveillance. But I also want to preface that, that the reason why we are doing this and, and this sort of like trying to do this into a community education and popularizing this thing, because in order to fight back, we have to know our fight. And it's, 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 it's really about building power and not paranoia, because unless we really know our fight, you know, it makes it very difficult that how do we do a deep dive into the structure. And, and the last few things I want to talk about is that, you know, that what is the broader structure that we are looking at. Then we talk about the stalker state, right? So this is just a basic example of how our information is collected and how is it shared in the Department of Motor Vehicle? Like how so many different ways, how many folks and how many of their own sections have access to information that, that, that is used to trace and track and share and monitor us. Uh, this is the housing and urban development. Like, you know, just we, now we, right now, the LAPD is pushing community safety partnerships into all, into uh, public housing projects in Jordan Downs, Dickerson Gardens, all 10 of them are going to have this, which basically is very much a counterinsurgency and counterterrorism project that they're moving. Um, this is health and human services, and even further down, that even HIPAA rules can be set aside. Uh, under because of national security investigations and police investigations, and which leads into what I was trying to get to is the stalker state. That mapping of the stalker state becomes really crucial that how information moves within the public sector to private sector, to fusion centers. Fusion centers are, are the central um, hubs of information gathering their warehouses. And there's about 80 plus of those around the country. One of the largest ones is in East Los Angeles County in Norwalk, where a lot of our information is uploaded um, and which can be accessed by every police department in the country, every local police department, sheriff's department, transit police, uh, campus police, uh, private corporations, foreign governments, on and on and on. Uh, and these are also hubs which basically blur the lines between uh, the international and local connection where the NSA claims that, you know, it's all only doing stuff internationally, although they were, they, were, they were listening in locally as well, but then they said, well, it's about non-citizens, on and on and on. But through this National Counterterrorism Center, NSA is sharing a lot of this information, which then goes into these fusion centers. And then from fusion centers, it goes into a lot of local, local, local pieces as well. So um, 
maybe I'll stop there, Andrew. I know you said 45 minutes, but I don't have to take 45 minutes. But I just wanted to set the tone as to, and maybe I can speak for a, a couple more minutes about how we are fighting back. Um, like what is our fight? And I think this is, so this was basically, I, I wanted to lay out that what all has it taken for us to do a deep dive and unpack this monstrosity, this very multi-layered um, infrastructure. Uh, but it's also, what, what it shows us is that more than invasion of privacy, it is the intent to cause harm. And that was really important that what does it mean when we talk about the intent to cause harm, that how is this being deployed and used? How predictive policing and the hotspots in predictive policing are being used to quarantine people, particularly poor folks in Skid Row. And rather than like, you know, this whole thing about the crime fighting and we can predict crime, which is all BS. Um, so the impact of that. So for the coalition, um, it was imperative that the way we started our work was that we spent the first eight and nine or nine months, we're based out of Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, the Los Angeles Community Action Network or LA CAN is our home, one of the key founding members. Uh, other founding members of the coalition are also Youth Justice Coalition, LA CAN. Uh, BLM is a very active partner with us now uh, since BLM's formation as well. And then the National Lawyers Guild and several other, um, you know, just uh, community-based groups. And folks primarily who are coming to a more abolitionist approach uh, to this work that, you know, that this is, this just cannot be reformed. This can't be done any better. So for us, it was really important to have this conversation with the communities to bring this conversation down to the ground level that what is the vocabulary that we need to develop? How do we need to even speak about surveillance? How do we not stay stuck in these very narrow scopes of like, you know, the constitutional violation and you know uh, what is uh, uh, what what legal precedents have been there this that and the other but also another thing was that to 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 my remind ourselves on the path that we were taking that the experiences that people are having on the street is our truth is absolutely that how people are sharing their stories that how they feel they have been they have been stalked how they feel they have been surveilled and moved so through that um, we've been building um, a lot of power. So, so knowledge and decolonization of the knowledge becomes a primary goal. Um, and in that, uh, we are not only looking at it through the lens of, okay, what rights been violated, but how nuanced is, is it and how does surveillance intersect with gender and sexuality? That what is it, what are the, what are the various nuances that it, that it cuts through? Uh, how is it intersecting with youth particularly? And then how the war on youth have been waged, and we and because of this work, we are now being able to we are able to recognize that the assault on youth is now taking on a much more national security significance that it used to be gang databases, gang injunctions, uh, juvenile systems, this, that, and the other. But increasingly, the language of violent extremism, the language of radicalization, the 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 policing of the youth, and then going after them with the full brunt. Of the, of the system is now the, where racketeering uh, cases the, uh, are, being, are being filed against young people. We just saw that Operation Crew got in New York and a lot of things are happening in LA as well. How is surveillance now evolving um, under the guise of science and this claim of science under this whole language of artificial intelligence, uh, under the language of risk assessment tools? So in order to fully understand and to fight back it was crucial that we do a very detailed deep dive and unpack and really equip ourselves that, you know, that, that how many different ways. The third piece I want to talk about is like, you know, that, that what have we, what kind of pushback we have had and what our fight has been. And quite frankly, I mean, the, I'm known not to hold back the in full, uh, uh, full being fully 100. We have a bigger issue within our own movements as well. We have actually actively organized against the ACLU because we exposed them uh, in 2015, where they were pushing because we completely reject, absolutely reject any ordinance and oversight legislation, because we don't believe that there needs to be a transparency or an oversight or a reporting mechanism because they murder transparently. The guy had his knee for over almost nine minutes on George Floyd's neck. They walked into Breonna Taylor's, uh, you know, just where, where, where they were living. And, and shot the heck out of it. 
Just yesterday, they shot this, you know, four cops killed an 18 year old. So on an average, when the cops are murdering people about, about seven and a half or eight people a day, and I use that term because when you look at their numbers, about 1200 murders that we know of by law enforcement, then when you divide it by 365 and use the hours, it comes to about almost a, so seven to eight people a day that are being murdered by law enforcement around the country. So in a sense where, so the answer was not to reform it. And what happened was that in 2015, the ACLU presented this, this model ordinance of an oversight and transparency ordinance. Um, and what we found out through public records that they sent that draft of that ordinance and this was supposed to be on the LAPD surveillance. They sent the draft of that ordinance to the head of LAPD's counterterrorism, right? I mean, this is, I'll say that again, that something that was going to be, they were pushing to pass legislation in the city of Los Angeles, and it's all on our website. If you go into our website and look for ACLU Exposed, all those emails and everything else have been posted there as well. So, so the point I'm raising here as well that as we continue to build power, of course, the external and out there too. So our power was, uh, knowledge was really built with the understanding that there's a lot to there's the, 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 there's a lot to fight back. There's a, there's a lot of education that is needed. There's a lot of popularization of this thesis. So where does art come in? Uh, where does music come in? Where, where does popular culture come in? Um, so we've been using like various zines and things like that. Um, uh, so in a sense, building that power then led to uh, some successes in, 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 in our campaigns as well. We were able to keep the drones grounded for about three and a half years. And ultimately they had to dismantle those drones. And now, but later on, they got some new ones. Okay, well, they reconfigure, but at least, you know, the fight's on, we're on that, you know, pushing them back constantly. And then a major piece that, that, that also happened was that we were able to push them and through people power uh, to dismantle predictive policing in Los Angeles where the LAPD dismantled part of it, Operation Laser um, and, and Chronic Offender Program in April of 2019. And finally, Pretpol was dismantled this year in April of 2020. And not only that, we were able to, and this was a precedent setting lawsuit as well that we had filed for public records. Um, and, and we forced them finally at the, towards the end of last year to release a secret list of individuals who were in the secret list. And now we are in the process of reaching out to those folks in a secret list as well. So to you know, to summarize all of this, um, I wanted to share it in such a way that first of all, like what is our fight? So what kind of tools are being used? What is the narrative that we are building our fight in? What sort of harm that we see happening on the regular? What is the scale and scope and size of the infrastructure? What are some of the challenges that we face? You know, I mean, all uh, as as our, our folks in uh, community, black community would say all skin folks are not kin folks. So I think how do we look at, you know, just what are the challenges on, uh, and how they are layered. Um, so, you know, here we are, and uh, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions and would love to hear comments. And I'll stop right there. Thank you. Well, Hamid, thank you so much for that. That was an amazing presentation. And I think you pulled so many threads together. I think maybe maybe one thing that I'd like to follow up with, if I could just ask you a couple of questions to get the conversation going, um, is to go back to what you were saying about abolition requiring some demolition, right? That there are things that need to be destroyed um, as we build this other world. And I think I bring that up partly because as you mentioned, the, the way that abolition is being talked about right now and is being popularized um, has been really fascinating, right? Since um, Ferguson and since the murder of George Floyd, I think abolition is a part of conversations that I never really imagined uh, it would be a part of, right? Um, and that's been really exciting and also challenging, I think, in many ways, right? So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how you and, and the coalition understands this relationship between world building and between the things that need to be abolished. And how, how does abolition 
kind of hold those two things together? How do we, how do we as abolitionists who are working on this long-term vision kind of hold these two, these two things together? Can you speak more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, both of them are not uh, mutually exclusive. They are very deeply intertwined because I think one of the ways that, uh, and, and a lot of us uh, come into it based on our own lived experiences, our own histories as well, how we understand this, what has been our own personal sort of, uh, uh, you know, just relationship to the state and, 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 and power uh, and, and dominant culture. Uh, I think the, but what a common narrative that people do come together is that abolition is a journey over time uh, that how do we make policing irrelevant in our lives? So, so that's really the, the, in a sense, a goal, or that's really the journey that when we talk about making policing irrelevant in our lives, so what would it take to make them irrelevant? Right, because so in a sense, over time, what is the the reduction in contact with law enforcement? What is the reduction in in basically independency? So in a sense, so first of all, it requires debunking a whole lot of things. Debunking in the sense where police and policing has become such a necessary element in our lives that it's almost seen um, as a public utility. It's almost seen as like water. And, and electricity that, you know, that in order for us to survive, we cannot survive, you know, without that. So how do we then, in a way, challenge these notions that no, some, there's something there. So in a sense, um, you know, when we talk about destruction or demolishing or dismantlement, I mean, however term, whichever term we want to use that, it is also something that, you know, and in my understanding, of course, in the, in the, in the long fight and the struggles, between in the, in the abolition of slavery and various other forms of, of oppression as well, that you know the, the, um, the, the, the infrastructures had to change as well. The, the whole idea of how and what the economy was based upon had to be shut down as well, I mean, in a sense. Now that's still a, a, a project that continues because in a sense, and it, there was this, this, this um, um, interesting comparison done by somebody for around reparations that, that why abolition seems really odd um, because what would it look like 200 years ago and particularly folks like Frederick Douglass and others who were the abolitionists of their time um, that, that when you have a system of, of, of uh, uh, plantation uh, uh, capitalism where people's, what we were, retirements are tied to, you know, if you will, you know, their lives are tied to it. The, the people who work, who are like the overseers and the owners of plantation because monies are being generated. So that whole system of, of how monies were being exchanged, how monies were being invested in, into what it was being invested. So that whole practice had to change. And in that, you know, in a sense, when we talk about destruction, it's not always, you know, taking a hammer and, and breaking the bricks out of it. Right, but it's also like in a sense that what would it look like? And this, I'm reminded of the Luddites as well of their actions too, as to what they saw as the machine as being so almost like you know in their quest for abolition of control of the machine where people were. But I think in in a sense to your question that they're deeply intertwined. Um, that obviously on one hand, if we were to and and by no means like you know there's a, there's any magic button or a delete button, but it's a journey over time. It's a multi generational fight. So let's say tomorrow, um, you know, LAPD is abolished. I mean, just saying that would be great. But do we need to destroy the building that they have? Or can that building be put to use to something else? Okay, of course, it'll have to be sanitized and cleaned out and a lot of these demons will have to be, you know, just, just taken out. But in a sense, so when I talk about destruction, it's also the practice also becomes uh, a, a part of the, the, in a sense, because we, we don't think of, because we were also, we have a whole project which is called Embody Abolition with our partners Color Coded. And we've been doing that for about three or four years. And in that we talk about that we, we know a lot of carceral technologies. And by technologies, I just don't mean the cell phone or things like that, but practice becomes a technology. So what is an abolitionist technology that we are developing in that practice? So through that practice, when we talk about demolishing and, 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 and destroying things, it is the erasure. It is a little sort of like deleting some of those things out of our lives as well. Now, whether it, it requires the, the, the completely the destruction of a, of a jail 
or you know people talk about a recreation and reusing of that jail even the the alternatives to that also needs to be very looked at that as well that as we talk about alternatives to policing well i mean is a, is a, is, a, is public health a, a mode of policing and the stalker state okay if we're going to change the healthcare system do we need to also destroy the beds and the stretchers and the wheelchairs and the and the and the needles and everything else a day to day or we need to stop the practice of how people are being dehumanized within a system as well. Yeah, I think one of the one of the organizations that you and I are familiar with and people in LA know so well is is Dignity and Power Now, another group that works uh, in in the in coalition with you. And I think they they absolutely kind of embody this this kind of work that you're talking about the intertwined ways that. Um, people have to build themselves up as we work to dismantle these systems, right? Mm. Um, I was also interested in kind of fleshing out this conversation about educational institutions. And I think that it would be worthwhile talking um, a little bit more about that, partly because we're speaking in a, in a so-called academic context. And I know that probably many of our listeners are engaged in uh, academic pursuits. And also I wanted to talk a little bit about the Cops Off Campus Coalition. So uh, I think there are some really interesting things that you brought up about how the academy has also um, functioned as sort of a third arm of uh, the surveillance state in many ways. And one thing that I'm really interested in um, as someone who's, who takes the idea of abolition seriously as a, as a teacher is trying to think not only about how we abolish policing as such, but how we think about the way that policing um, infiltrates all of these other spaces in our lives, right? Um, my colleague at UC Riverside, Dylan Rodriguez, argues that administration is a form of policing on mm -hmm. the university campus, right? Mm -hmm. So that when we, and, and, and how we could think about decolonizing our syllabus, our syllabi, Right? How, how we bring the question of abolition into our engagement in, in educational institutions. Um, I, before I talk about the Cops Off Campus Coalition, um, do you have any further thoughts about that or you, uh, your engagement with, with education around some of that stuff? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, uh, obviously we had a whole campaign going on starting with the, about the last couple of years uh, uh, from uh, called academic complicity to academic rebellion, um, where we were going after Professor Jeffrey Branthingham and his cohorts. Uh, he is a co-creator of Predpol, uh, the department or the chair of the Department of Anthropology at UCLA, and several other mathematicians and other folks as well. So we've been building a campaign. Um, we even did this whole took the fight over to Luskin Center uh, on, on March 4th of this year too. So, so I think it's also that while on one hand, the administration is a definitely a part of the police state, but I, I would also argue that the whole development, as you said, decolonizing the curriculum is at the service to white supremacy as well. And within that, um, to maintain and preserve, uh, you know, control is, is extremely critical. Now, whether that, that requires that what would be the, the, the allocation of one's vocation or, or, or pursuits, professional pursuits, how it's almost a process of social engineering, I would say, that how that social engineering happens um, where we are triggered to, and in a sense, you know, as Edward Banfield would say, um, that they should be taken out and, you know, just of, of, of and, and the ninth grade and that that's enough. So at what service would ninth grade be? And, and in a sense where, you know, on one hand, this whole propaganda of meritocracy is there, um, but, on the, but what does meritocracy serve? And ultimately who is in that layer of meritocracy? So I think to your point, absolutely. I think it is something that we, the academy is deeply entrenched, um, not only on the, on the uh, uh, forward facing level of the research and the R and D, and, and the development of, of uh, the materials of harm, the, the, the theories of harm, but also in a sense that how people are being programmed in service to 
uh, and, and nothing new that that we are saying. I mean, these have been, and and I think down to where, and of course, on a middle school level, because our whole war on youth campaign has been going into and speaking to middle school youth, and they've all, and our youth folks have already are developing their own youth stalker state. That what does it mean, right? So in a sense, um, I think it's it's really instructive for all of us, and it's it's it'll also it'll, it becomes provides us a roadmap that how the, the depth of where this thing goes and where our fight is. I see that there's um, a couple of questions in the chat, but maybe I can take a, this opportunity to also talk a little bit about the Cops Off Campus Coalition, because I think it really does dovetail nicely with the work that you're doing and also this conversation about, um, about the Academy. Um, just to give people a little bit of background, um, Last year, many of you probably know, there was a broad cost of living movement across the UCs. Primarily, it started at UC Santa Cruz and basically grad students at UC Santa Cruz who work for the university, um, they couldn't afford housing in Santa Cruz. And so they started a series of actions that spread across the campuses fighting for cost of living increases basically trying to get a decent wage for the work that they do for the university. And it was a pretty amazing movement. Um, they went on strike, uh, a grade strike, and this had kind of amazing ripple effects across the UC system. And kind of building on that in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, groups across the UC system got together to start thinking about how policing um, takes place on campus. And in many ways, a lot of the questions and the work that you've done um, has really been inspiring to us. And we're, we're sort of trying to build on a, a number of the points that you make today. Um, so there's a group that was formed um, with the goal of getting all police off of UC campuses by next fall. And that's the UC FTP uh, coalition or the Cops Off Campus Coalition. And it's a broad group um, faculty, staff, and students working together on all 10 campuses. We launched our campaign on October 1st with direct actions on almost every campus and some CSU campuses as well. And one of the interesting things to kind of springboard off of things that you've already talked about is immediately we realized that as important as it is to get cops off campus, we also understood that to do this kind of abolitionist work, we would need to really think about what that means. And we would need to make connections with abolitionist groups working off of campus in areas where each campus lies. We understood that this kind of thinking about non-reformist reforms um, always opens up as many questions as it answers, right? So how do we work towards the practical goal of getting police off of the campus while also recognizing that we would need to build up uh, forms of mutual aid that would <clears throat> allow students and staff and faculty to address forms of harm that do happen on campus um, without resorting to carceral logics, right? Without re resorting to caging and punishment as a response to every incident of harm that happens on campus. And given that <clears throat> um, there is so much concern with safety and security on campus, we, we recognize that the kinds of mutual aid work um, that would be required is actually a very, very enormous task. And so we're in the process of kind of gathering more and more people into this work and trying to build up an infrastructure um, that again, as you, and that's part of why I asked about it is to, is to both build an infrastructure and work to dismantle forms of policing on campus. Um, and again, think about how the long-term vision of abolition does include very practical short-term goals. And so that tension that you, that you describe um, between building and, and dismantling is something that's very much been a part of our conversations. And um, so I think there's, there's much, in, much in common there. 
Um, definitely, definitely. Yeah, no, I was there on October 1st and it was uh, definitely a great action. And then back on November 1st as well, the, the at the Jackie Robinson Stadium. So, so folks are on the move. It's good to see that. Let's, um, Nikki asks in the chat, um, the coalition zines um, are, are a great way to distribute knowledge and insights to folks. Uh, what other avenues do you suggest for decommodifying information on abolition? Do you have some thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I think it's it's uh, uh, it's always uh, I'm 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 an old school organizer where door knocking was uh, always a thing and just, just sort of standing and chatting to folks on the street uh, was always a thing as well. So uh, I think conversations and organizing these kind of conversations um, because I think it's 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 a uh, one doesn't want to walk into as knowing it all and you know lecturing and all of that i think just if, so if zines are always i mean the the, uh, the conversational spaces are always helpful because it becomes it, it is it is helpful to to kind of just decolonize the knowledge as i said earlier and to do that collective knowledge building and collective power but also you know just uh, um it, uh, i'll put a plug in where we have a, a webinar every tuesday um because we used to meet every tuesday in skid row and we wanted to keep these conversations going. So every so this is we just had our 35th webinar last Tuesday uh, since March 21st. So every Tuesday we've been having a webinar. So join us over there. And I think there are also other folks like how are folks looking at abolition as well? And, and there's different scholarships on abolition. Ruthie Gilmore has written extensively. And I know Mariam Kaba has been doing work and uh, Rachel Herzing. Uh, so in a sense, um, how are different folks approaching? Because I think each person has to really formulate um, their own sense of what abolition would look like because based on their own location where they are and, and how they see um, society just, just function. Uh, particularly, it's, it's a big question about like, what are we gonna do without the police? I mean, the first question is, what about the rapists and the murderers? Well, what are we doing now about the rapists and the murderers? So, you know, so in a sense, like, so, so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's any prescription to that, but it's more or less like it's more about engagement than anything else. Absolutely. Um, would you would you be open to talking a little bit more about where you see some of the fights in LA going? I mean, I'm always struck by um, the fact that we have a so-called progressive mayor, um, and it's amazing to me that Garcetti has. Um, sort of managed to maintain his reputation as a, as a progressive mayor, especially uh, with what you know about, what we all know now after your presentation about the LAPD. Um, can you talk about the relationship between the mayor's office and the LAPD and, and sort of how you see that evolving amidst these calls for defunding and abolition? Well, I think we have to also look at uh, one's uh, orientation as well. So Garcetti, uh, his dad was a DA um, and which was a, uh, a prosecutor. So that orientation, and of course, not to say that you, that, you know, you, you, you can't shut up. I, I grew up in Pakistan where the only options are working for the state. I had family members who are cops, close family members or people in the military because that's the only way you can find a job. So, but, but I think it's as, but I, I, he has remained basically a tool of the establishment. I mean, he's a tool. And, and his closeness to LAPD also comes because he's also a Naval uh, Intelligence Reservist. So he's also a, a Lieutenant in, as, as a Naval Reservist and who's, uh, who's in the intelligence branch. So Garcetti, and ultimately I think it's also like Garcetti is very much a political animal where he's been at the service to um, primarily the developers because the developers really just, just to control, the developers just really set the tone on, on what politics would look like in Los Angeles, who's in, who's out, because it's about land. And so, so I think I see a constant fight, but I'm definitely where we are now, and I'm definitely encouraged post um, George Floyd because the ground uh, has shifted. Yes, I mean, whether we had a full on abolition or not, no, but the ground has shifted. And I, what I saw was on the streets, having been out there uh, as well, that, you know, just, just young people were really leading the charge in a very autonomous way as well. 
And what, you, what we heard from them was not your sort of classic vanguard language around Marxism and, and, and socialism and other things as well, but really in the sense that this is really messed up. What we are living under and what we are living in, this ain't, this ain't working. So I think what people are envisioning and imagining, I think this is also a moment that how do we then come together? Um, obviously on the flip side, the challenges remain that, I mean, which to me sounds a complete oxymoron that to say a progressive pro prosecutor, there's no such thing as a progressive prosecutor. The most powerful uh, 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 place in an in, in office in the criminal justice system. So, so now the fight really is, which would be very interesting because the, we are also launching a campaign against Gascon. And Gascon, who was, and, and, but, but not without honoring the brilliant uh, organizing, just from an organizing vantage point that Black Lives Matter did uh, to bring and really create a space for the first time for uh, at that level for so many families, for so many families to speak out and speak out publicly about the violence of the system. So, so I think that the, we, when we start looking at the moving parts, um, obviously the, the, the system is constantly resetting itself. Um, where are we gonna go? Of course, with COVID, we can't uh, have this conversation without looking at the, the impact, um, the ensuing, you know, after January 1, we don't know what level of evictions are gonna happen. How long is this rent issue gonna be maintained before the landlords really come down hard? So we're looking at mass unemployment. We're looking at um, mass displacement of people. What kind of impact would that have? So in a sense, um, the information sharing on the flip side is also where Palantir, a major data processing company that works for the that that does work for the police departments and Department of Defense and CIA, uh, has a the main contract with Health and Human Services. Uh, of the, it's called Protect. So how that information is going to be gathered around uh, contact tracing and things like that. So there's several things moving, and I think all we can what we need to be doing is to really keep our vigilance up. Uh, watch, see that situational awareness. Um, do not shy away from constantly challenging and pushing back, and and continue to organize because uh, the it's not something that all of a sudden Trump is gone. Trump basically picked up on the playbook that already existed, and what we have in replacement are two uh, cops. I mean, Biden is re responsible, and I would say that to what happened to George Floyd the 94 bill and the following 1996 bills and everything else that has followed. I mean, these are playbooks that were created all along uh, to how the harm is happening. So we, and then Kamala Harris comes from that school of as a prosecutor, as a DA, as an attorney general. Um, the biggest challenge is in policing we're looking at is this whole uh, language of data-driven stuff, uh, risk assessments, predictive analytics, machine learning. So that we need to constantly fight back and debunking. We have a whole campaign around that. I want to I want to honor my comrade Jamie Garcia, who's been leading this fight, who led that fight for the Coalition Against Predictive Policing. So it's 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 really about how much do we stay informed, Ken, and how do we keep on knowing our fights? Yeah, thank you. That's that's really helpful. I I would I, I want to lift up two things that you talked about. One is is the importance of real estate in Los Angeles and how much it's connected to policing. Right. Um, I'll just mention uh, Robin Kelly, who's an amazing um, historian at UCLA, has a new piece out about. Um, policing and racial capitalism in a journal called Spectre. And one of the things he does in that article in a very kind of concise way is talk about how much of policing is about protecting property. And the, the connection that you make right between Garcetti and the LAPD and developers kind of highlights, spotlights those connections in a really important way. And I think that that's something that we should you know, draw out in terms of the housing crisis, in terms of gentrification in the city, and in terms of, um, you know, houseless folks. Um, your organization has done so much around this, this subject, but to really make people aware of those connections seems super important. And then Before also, you, just to, so let me just quickly show you something, Ken, on that point, exactly what you just said. This is a map of Skid Row. This is the thick of Skid Row. We are based right here in Gladys and Sixth. So what we did, what this is showing exactly to your point about land and policing, that we filed for public records of two different six-month time periods of LAPD's predictive policing hotspots. 
right? And hotspots are basically uh, that they say that previous crime data, the, the, the more current crime data, mix it together in a milkshake, and they'll tell you like when where crime may, may happen. But when we posted them, the 2015 and 2018 um, hotspots, you know, what to our surprise as well, having have been doing this work for so long, that Skid Row was sort of like a blank space. So, but what we realized was that, wait, the algorithmic ecology is as such that these hots, because what these hotspots do is they drive patrols into these areas. And these, this is the new downtown, this dense area. So the hotspots were not about crime production or prediction. These were about protection of property and the new downtown. So in a sense, you'll have patrols over here. And if anybody dared to move from Skid Row into this new downtown and lofts and everything else, you'll have a hold. So this, this whole, almost like a, a, a quarantining effect of Skid Row took place as a result. So I just wanted to quickly share that to your point about land and policing and how uh, land gets policed as well. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, the other thing that I, I, I wanna also lift up is, is sh yeah, shouting out um, the huge victory of getting Jackie Lacey out of office and the amazing work that um, BLMLA did. Um, if, if folks, did, didn't weren't aware of every Wednesday for years, um, you know, gathering in front of the so-called Hall of Justice and hearing from people who were impacted by state violence. I mean, one of the things that so that was so amazing about that work was um, noticing how how much care work was involved in that activism. Right? I mean, if you if you visited or if you participated in those in those events, it was clear that not only were people rallying um, to get rid of Jackie Lacey, but they were also honoring what the state cannot do, right? Which is make up for stolen lives. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was, that's been an amazing thing to watch and be a, be a part of. Um, so there's a couple of questions that I wanna to touch on that are in the, in the chat and, um, Matthew asks, what are some emancipatory models of education? And also um, Natalie sort of wonders if it's paradoxical or impossible to talk about those inside of the academy. Um, I have some thoughts on that too, but let's, let's see, what, what do you think? No, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take your lead because you're an educator. So I wanna hear what, what, how you would approach it. Somebody from the inside. <laughs> sure, well, as you know, I teach at both CalArts and at UC Riverside. So I have an interesting vantage point from um, a private art school and a public university. And I think that does give me a, a, some insight into these different kind of ways that education is working. And obviously I think at a very basic level, you know, we have to fight against the notion of austerity. Um, as being the predominant neoliberal framework through which um, so many people think about education. And um, when we talk about emancipatory models of education, we also just have to start there that we know it's not austerity. Um, and you know, part of the Cops Off Campus Coalition um, in thinking about what it would mean to get cops off campus, we recognize that really making um, public educational institutions free and making the UCs more accessible. Um, those are very simple, practical, tangible steps um, that the state could make in terms of thinking about more emancipatory models of education. At the same time, you know, I think we do also need to keep in mind a kind of long-term horizon where uh, the kind of gatekeeping that you talked about um, is, is undermined, right? Where we think about educational processes as not being a ladder for forms of social climbing, which reinforce the kinds of hierarchies, um, racist and patriarchal hierarchies that we're working to undo. So, um, you know, education does not have to be a kind of gatekeeping function in our society, right? And the kinds of, so I think for me at least, Emancipatory education begins with understanding that education does not need to function in that way. And there are all sorts of ways to undermine, undermine that. I think that having one foot in the academy and one foot out is a reasonable position. 
when we all live with multiple contradictions. I don't think it's impossible to do important, meaningful, um, and positive abolitionist work within the institution. But doing so means that universities <coughs> and art schools as we currently know them may not exist in the future. They might have to be transformed into something else entirely. And I think for those of us that are engaged in education and take these questions about emancipation seriously, have to be willing to seriously consider whether the university or the art school as it's currently constituted needs to exist. And I certainly don't feel like it does. I think that for me, um, you know, education means thinking about how we undermine the kind of structures that we inhabit. And mm -hmm. that might require abolishing um, the educational institutions that we, that we live with. Um, that's a starting point. No, I think definitely thank you for sharing that. I mean, I think well, what I would uh, build upon that would be that how uh, we think of education. I mean, I think it's also very important as well because the formal structures of education are what about 4,000 years? I don't know, just like, you know, just where, um, uh, and of course, going back to the whole history of madrasas and things like that, um, where, so education, just like, you know, transfer of knowledge, uh, sharing of knowledge has been always there. It's been going on as far as we can remember. How, when it, how it got formalized and for the, what purpose it got from formalized becomes also something to be looked at and from that formalization, you know, what, what, what came out uh, was it became more of an assignment, a prescription uh, rather to how to be rather than what one can be. And, and so in a sense, and I'm also, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if uh, Ken, you had a chance to read, uh, oh my gosh, um, the conversations between Miles Horton and Pablo Freire, uh, we make the road by walking. Uh, if folks don't know, Miles Horton was the, the uh, one who uh, created the Highlander Center in Tennessee. And, you know, so some of the things that they talk about is like, you know, how our thoughts can be popularized and put into practice. And, and what, is, what does that even mean? What does popular education even mean? So I think in a sense, all I would, I would add to, 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 to your point would be that there needs to be our own reorientation and a lot of an abolition goes back to abolition as well, that abolition is more about unlearning. There's a whole lot of shedding and unlearning that we need to do and a reorientation that needs to happen that what do we think of education and, and either, either it's the demonization of education or it's uplifting of education. But education by itself is something that, that sharing of knowledge um, and, and this maintenance of that knowledge becomes really crucial. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the one of the things that I've been thinking about in terms of the UCs is also the obviously the there's a whole population uh, among the UCs that are undocumented. There are a number of there are so many uh, international students, and it, it kind of brings me to. To your point about nationalism in terms of how the police in LA um, gather technology from the military. And so I, I wonder if we could kind of circle back to thinking about um, borders and immigration and the kind of connections between local forms of policing and the, the real need to think internationally around these abolitionist questions. Um, for me, at least, part of the conversation about emancipatory education always leads me to think about an, a form of internationalism and how we really kind of need to revive a strong foundation of thinking internationally. Um, and given what you were saying, both from your own personal experience, but also in terms of how the LAPD operates. Um, we know, of course, that there's been all of this correspondence between the LAPD and the Israeli military, for example, um, or the, the struggles in, in Palestine. Um, can you talk about that a little bit more and say, 
say a little bit more about how the LAPD has has internationalized some of its programs? Oh, definitely. Uh, well, some of the uh, more uh, immediate things that, uh, well, LAPD is an international agency. Let's start with that, NYPD, LAPD. LAPD has been uh, guiding and, and, and in a way consulting even when Rio World Cup soccer was going on and Rio Olympics were going on. But LAPD also was training El Salvadorian paramilitary squads in the 1980s. LAPD also had in the 2000s uh, uh, during the occupation and continuing occupation of Iraq, about 70 uh, Marine Corps individuals assigned to the LAPD who were patrolling uh, the areas that LAPD would patrol in South Central Los Angeles and other areas too, to basically learn urban guerrilla warfare tactics and counterinsurgency and hone in those tactics as well, um, which then led to the, which were deployed in Al-Anbar and some of the other places in Iraq. So I think in that, in that vein, LAPD has a pretty big footprint. Um, and, and Bill Bratton, I mean, like even to the extent who was a former chief of LAPD, there were questions whether he was going to be the head of Scotland Yard about a few years ago, if you remember that as well. So in a sense, the law, and, and, and I think it's also how LAPD has been glorified. So here also, maybe the fourth leg of the stool is, is Hollywood and that the Hollywoodization of policing um, becomes, becomes really crucial. So I think and in, in the service of a global empire and you know, as uh, in, 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 in neoliberalism, LAPD definitely runs deep. I mean, it just runs deep on many different levels. Now, going back to where does it fit in and with, with education and the Israeli LA connections, I think we also have to look into that how do we do knowledge exchange and how knowledge is absorbed as well. Because for example, the world is seen through the historic lens of conquest and, and the conquerors as if civilizations began with that, as if like, you know, people, rather than like, you know, having a much more deeper approach, because once we do that, then obviously borders would emerge because uh, control emerges, dominance emerges, uh, economies emerge. Uh, so how that control is maintained, what are the, 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 the checks and balances, what are the mechanism to protect uh, the, the, that conquest and that land as well, which gives rise to borders and checkpoints and everything else. I mean, now we're seeing more modern versions of, of nation states and all. But I think um, uh, going back to, you know, just things like, for example, you know, Vijay Prashad's uh, People's History of the Third World or, or Howard Zinn's People's History of the, the United States and all. I think, uh, uh, and, and, and it was interesting because my daughter uh, teaches high school uh, in South Central and in and, and, and LAUSD and just started teaching about two years ago. But she was also in Mexico as well uh, for, for a little while. And I was asking her, like, you know, how is she teaching history? And she goes, you know, I just, uh, I just uh, draw movement of water. And through that movement of water, it's not like, you know, river-based civilizations, but movement of water, which, which gives life that what were those, how were people settling around it? And what was that knowledge exchange looking like going back to that? And what sort of uh, social structures were emerging through that as well? Now, whether they took an egalitarian turn or they took more of a formal control turn, that obviously, you know, I mean, there, there are several layers to that as well. So I think uh, bringing it back um, to uh, education and then to LABD, both on an international level and a local level as well, that it is, it's almost like it, it is a necessary presence in our life and, and that needs to be shed and that unlearning needs to happen but that can only happen from a lot of unlearning of a lot of other things can because I mean that requires unlearning a whole lot of consumption that requires a whole lot of reorientation towards capital so so yeah absolutely um well as we move to wrap up maybe I'll just bring up one one final point which is to kind of try to consider the role of art in abolition, abolition work. Um, and as, as an artist myself is something that I've, I've thought a lot about. And I, I, I wanna give a shout out to uh, my CalArts colleague, Ashley Hunt also, who has done such amazing work um, around thinking about the visibility and invisibility of, of carceral logics, um, mostly through photography and writing. Um, 
and whose work has kind of informed how I think about some of this stuff. But I think that one of the kind of abolitionist politics, I would say, is kind of thinking very long term, right? And that one of the themes that we encounter in abolitionist texts is often this envisioning of an abolitionist horizon. And artists are sometimes called upon to help imagine what that abolitionist horizon looks like. And I think that, again, th there are no sort of simple answers around what that abolitionist horizon looks like, but it is a kind of aesthetic practice to consider these long-term goals of a world without carceral logic. And, and in particular, thinking about <clears throat> how we overcome things like you mentioned consumption, but how we overcome, you know, the white gaze and the spectacle of, da of black death that we seem to continue to be living through, right? So I do think that there are aesthetic questions that are um, embedded in these conversations. And um, I don't know if you have thoughts about them, but um, maybe that's also a place where we can move to wrap up. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the, this whole conversation basically uh, just, just it guides us into that as well, because it's it's obviously there's so many layers that we are looking to constantly unpack. But I think it's the it's uh, one of the things. It's also which, as an immigrant, um, you are reminded. The first thing is about the ta the tabloid nature of culture. That you know that that the, the level of sensationalism and the level of uh, tabloidness, I would say, is so deeply rooted um, that, that how it moves from there and who has the mic at that moment and who's on the receiving end, I think becomes really critical. So I think, I mean, it just, it just really comes back to that, you know, just rather than this whole gatekeeper mentality, as you were speaking about it earlier, Ken, it's more or less like, you know, what is our, what is our collective vision and how are we just kind of referencing, referencing that vision uh, against, you know, what we have in the current moment and, and how do we move forward and think about that what life would be? Because on one hand, in the city of LA, and I'll, I'll stop here by saying, uh, we had some good Measure J and, and, and Prop 25 and other things as well. But when you look at the state, you know, just it's 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 a warning sign too, because uh, uh, 22 failed, 16 failed, and 15 failed. So you know, property tax issue, affirmative action issues, to whatever extent we want to go, and the whole uh, uh, the, the the Uber piece of independent contractor. Now these and this was something that I was talking to somebody else the other day, and we were having this discussion that three main corners. So these were the three things that we would always extol on, like you know, very level that. But now. What would that mean in the long run? So in a sense, what sort of restrictions and constrictions that's going to place on us? I think that's up to us to what, that, what our fight is. So we continue to organize and build power. Well, I want to thank you personally. I've, I've uh, gotten so much out of uh, your work and the work of the coalition. So I appreciate being in conversation. Thank with you. you. You're very welcome. Appreciate it. Yeah. And let's everyone in the audience thank both uh, Ken, but especially Hamid for this Amazing event, uh, really excellent presentation, but then such a wide ranging conversation going through questions of education and really rethinking it, but also all these incredible details of how abolition really needs to be on the agenda for just about everything. And you know, thank you to the audience for joining us here for WAP. Uh, tune in here again at tiny.cc 2020 WAP here in two weeks for Brian Jordan Jefferson, who is a geographer who's written this amazing history of crime mapping arguing that the digitization of the process is also part of this long history, not just some uh, short sort of uh, uh, transformation, but also delving into how it intersects with capitalism and information capitalism, as well as race and racial capitalism. Um, and uh, his case studies from his book, Digitize and Punish, come through Chicago and New York. So it'll be interesting to sort of move the conversation nationally. And we'll have a respondent here who will also talk about Los Angeles. So once again, let's thank both our uh, presenters and uh, really appreciate